Hello, I'm Jonathan Tobin, Editor-in-Chief of the Jewish News Syndicate, JNS.org, and you're listening to Top Story, a weekly podcast where I analyze the most important stories happening in Jewish news around the world. Each week, I will break down politics, foreign policy, and culture to provide insights into what is going on behind the headlines. Hello, and welcome to Top Story. 19 months after the coronavirus pandemic brought global life to a standstill, we're still struggling struggling to figure out how to cope with the dangers of an insidious virus and the effects it has had on society. As lockdowns intended to give us two weeks to flatten the curve gave way to long-term shutdowns that have given governments power no one would have dreamed of giving them before places like Wuhan and people like Anthony Fauci went from being obscure references to touchstones of public discourse. Finding a path that can encompass sensible precautions against a deadly disease and a genuine public health emergency that pose a particular peril to the elderly but statistically relatively little danger to the young without sacrificing our economy and the rights of individuals, has proved elusive. Coming as it did in the midst of a divisive presidential election that centered around the polarizing personality of former President Donald Trump and punctuated by the moral panic about race that followed the death of George Floyd in a summer of mostly peaceful Black Lives Matter riots, common sense was sacrificed on both ends of the partisan spectrum as reactions to the disease became politicized, with devotion to mask wearing becoming the MAGA caps of those on the left and vaccine resistance becoming lionized on the right. At a time when the widespread availability of vaccines, that while not eradicating a virus that obviously is going to be a semi-permanent presence in our lives, should be enabling us to move on from the obsession with COVID, Americans remain stuck in a polarized drama in which paranoia, overweening government power, and contempt for a right to personal sovereignty over our bodies that was heretofore considered sacred by people when it came to things like abortion, has become the top societal concern. And just as American society has become bifurcated between red and blue, defined by different sets of media and political truths, so too have our COVID regimes become split with deep blue states like New York enacting intrusive vaccine and masking mandates, while redder ones like Florida have loosened restrictions with few people wearing masks indoors or outdoors. Predictably, among those caught in the crossfire are children and our education system, where fear about the disease mixed with the desire of some political constituencies like the teachers' unions have resulted in policies that stole a year of in-person school from developing minds and now forces masking and distancing policies that are completely unmoored from anything resembling science. Meanwhile, no one at the top or at any other level of government, including the CDC, which is supposed to be providing expertise rather than running the country, has provided any kind of accountability for their mistakes, their abrupt policy changes, or their rulings which have impacted our ability to function as a society. To help us break down where this has left us, we're pleased to have with us one of the most astute observers of this issue and others. Bethany Mandel is a contributing writer for Deseret Magazine and a part-time editor for Ricochet.com. Her work has appeared in Commentary, where we once worked together, as well as The Forward and The Washington Examiner. Her life has been full of events and adventure, including a year teaching in Cambodia. She's a remarkably prolific writer, an influencer on Instagram, and perhaps most remarkably, she's also a homeschooling stay-at-home mother of five, age seven and under. Bethany Mandel, welcome to Top Story. Jonathan, you added so much to my bio that I thank you. (laughs) Well, I'm the editor. I get to say what I want. (laughs) I love it. Anyway, it's great to have you on. Promotion one day, God willing. Yeah, God willing, right? (laughs) (laughs) Well, anyway, in your writing, you've been particularly upset about the way the politicization of the pandemic has sacrificed the best interests of children in favor of policies that please teachers or unaccountable government officials. Why do you think this has happened? And do you see a way out of it in the current environment, both politically and medically? So to answer your second question, no. 
Uh, and it's because no one seems to care about children. I, I, I kind of, I feel like, gosh, what is that Simpsons character, Lovejoy, where she, mm-hmm. her like signature phrase is, someone please think of the children. That's me. I, I am her. And I'm just, you know, screaming into the void. Please, will someone please think about the children? I I find it inexplicable that I, I truly think that God has handed us a gift in the fact that unlike the 1918 flu pandemic or which targeted people in their 20s and 30s in the prime of their life, COVID targets those who have already lived full lives. And obviously we don't want a virus to target anyone, but it's, you know, if we're all being honest here. Um, it's, you know, I'm glad that it doesn't target one-year-olds the same way it targets 95-year-olds. Um, so God has given us this gift of the fact that children are not susceptible to ill effects. They are not at increased risk of death. They are not really even spreaders, which is so funny thinking about how children are with literally every other virus known to humanity. When my children get a virus, I am guaranteed to get it two weeks not two weeks, two days later. Mm-hmm. So COVID is, is unlike almost every other virus. And we have taken that gift that God has given us and thrown it back in his face. And now if you look at places, I mean, even where I live here in Montgomery County in Maryland, kids are still masked. Kids are still distanced. Tons of small businesses that are kid sort of centric. I'm thinking of our like local little gym cl- have closed. Our mm-hmm. local indoor playground has closed. Um, At my kids' uh, outdoor soccer league, uh, my children are the only ones not in masks because the league strongly recommends every child wear a mask. And um, there's, you know... And this is outdoors. Outdoors, yes. Um, So this this is the mitigation that children are being subjected to. And then you compare it to, like, the restaurants are open, the bars are open, offices are open. So what's the priority here? What's our societal priority? And we're, we're making clear that our societal priority is to keep all of these businesses open, which great. I mean, I agree. We should keep our businesses open, but if we're making a choice between businesses and, you know, the lives of our children, why is it the former instead of the latter? Um, and why are we ignoring the silent, the science on children and COVID in the process? And yet we have. Yeah. And consistently so, and yeah. remain stuck in that. Yeah, now, yeah. And and as someone who's you know been certainly unafraid of controversy in your writing, at one point last year you helped spawn a Twitter uh, meme yeah. about being a quote unquote grandma killer. Yeah. Um, like most things that go viral on Twitter, that was really a false characterization, obviously, of your views. But it also illustrated the way arguments by the pandemic quickly became a function of false choices and bizarre. Yeah unscientific orthodoxies. Now, um, you know, I I know I started out worrying in my own writing when this all began, worrying that because of perceptions about shortages, like respirators, which turned out to be not a thing, but which we were all told was a thing, um, I worried that, um, you know, in, in triage, we would actually make the the elderly expendable. I, you know, and, and I thought that was you yeah. know, we we got reports out of Italy that things like that were happening, but it turned out that that legitimate fear um, was turned on its head. Yeah. So why don't you break down a little bit how the, the you know the, that crazy grandma killer thing, you know, started, how it played out, and sort of what do you think it means that this kind of Serious discussions about balancing, you know, ethics and um, understanding, you know, risks and managing risk turned into the sort of just, you know, opprobrium that and vituperation that, that governs everything in, in American political life now. Yeah, absolutely. So I want to say since we're a video podcast and you just heard a sneeze, that was not mine. I'm holding my three month old. So <laughs> apologies in advance. <laughs> um, so with Grandma Killer, so. The sort of the backstory was um, I I had a a friend who owned my kid's little gym, speaking of which, um, Mm -hmm. and she told me that day, like, things are not going great. Uh, They had mandated to be shut down and um, and they got stimulus money, but not enough to I mean, they were they were 
not legally allowed to open their doors, but they were still obligated to pay all of their employees because they took stimulus money. They were obligated to pay all of their insurance, all of their rent, all of their utilities, everything. All of their expenses remained the same, only they were legally banned from taking in any income whatsoever. And so it was early May of 2020, and I kind of said the thing that I had been thinking for about five weeks at that point, which was, well, we were told two weeks to stop the spread. It's been a lot more than two weeks already. It's been two months. And in looking back in retrospect, I'm like, oh, oh, you sweet summer child. <laughs> you thought two months was a lot. <laughs> two months. Yeah. A year and a half right? later. Right. Right. And so I kind of said like, okay, we were warned that the hospitals would be overrun and that exactly what you described, we would be playing sort of triage figuring mm -hmm. out who lives and who dies. Right. We never played that game in America. Thank God we have a better healthcare system than Italy. And we didn't get hit the same way outside of the New York area. And even out, even in the New York area, they didn't get hit as hard as Italy did. And so what exactly is the off-ramp and what, what are we doing here? And it's sort of funny because in the thread I said, are we waiting for vaccines? Now here we are a year and a half later and we've had vaccines and I'm still asking what the off-ramp is because we have three highly effective vaccines and we still have not been told when does life go back to normal? And so I sort of was really pained in that that day sort of saying like you know what i'm going to i'm going to say the thing that i've been thinking because i'm watching my child my children's childhood be ripped out from under them and i'm seeing their pediatrician have an empty office is their office going to survive because people don't realize that pediatricians and dentists and physical therapists all of these medical professions these are businesses and when they don't have a sick visit for two months and they are have kids that are too afraid to come in for a well visit first of all that has public health ramifications of its own in lowered vaccination rates for things like mmr but mm -hmm. when a pediatrician's office doesn't have a kid come in for two months that affects their bottom line and so i'm sort of looking at all these businesses looking at my kids pediatrician looking at our dentist and my kids dentist and sort of looking sort of wider at the businesses like my friend's little gym where my kids were going. And I'm like, what is going to be left at the end of this? Um, and I also in the thread mentioned the zoo, which became sort of a, a meme in itself that you care more about the zoo animals than you do about about grandma. And as you said, it, it, it's a false choice. You don't the choice isn't the giraffe or grandma. We could have been going to the zoo the whole time safely um, and Fast forward to several months later, um, I, mean, I think it was probably a year later, and the my national zoo here in Washington announced that the their nonprofit arm, the Friends of the National Zoo, the FONS for short, um, mm -hmm. they do all of the programming, they do um, all of the events, they ran concessions, they did a lot of um, a lot of cons conservation work. Uh, and they also did all the education programs, like the, the homeschool classes my kids were doing. And uh, because they had been forced closed for a year and a half and the National Zoo was not taking in any income and therefore the Fonz wasn't either, the Fonz closed. And so now the National Zoo is a shell of its former self and they don't run events, they don't do programming, they don't do nearly as much conservation, if any. And now people, so fast forward to, I think it was like a week ago, the National News announced that they're not doing the boo at the zoo event. And people are like, what? We don't understand. This is horrible. We don't. And I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. Did a Halloween not realize event, that you're, just for yeah. those who didn't know. Yeah. No. Did you not realize that actions have consequences? When you closed the zoo for a year and then the fawns closed, that means the boo in the zoo is over. And that means every event that you loved doing at the zoo is over. I hope it was worth it because you gave up everything and you got nothing. Yeah, that's exactly right. All of these precautions, supposedly saving grandma, didn't save grandma because, of course, in, in a number of states, people like Andrew Cuomo and Phil Murphy yeah. and Gretchen Whitmer, you know, and, and here in where I live in Pennsylvania, Tom Wolf, you know, mm -hmm. people, COVID patients were, you know, were ordered yeah. back into nursing homes. And, you know, slaughter in, you know, resulted. Yep. Um, and no we'll account never talk about that. No, and no accountability for nope. that. Um, our, you know, Under Secretary of Health nationally, who was the Secretary of Health yep. in Pennsylvania, pulled her, his, her mother out of 
the nursing home yep. to save her. Yep. And that didn't even really come up in, in, in the confirmation hearings. And if you dared say anything about that, you were a transphobe. And you're like... Yeah, that, that, that's exactly what I was called for raising that issue. Yes. <laughs> I'm like, but I actually just don't like the policies that that person enacted in their professional role in which you're now giving them a massive promotion. It has nothing to do with how they identify right. as a man or a woman. Um, it was honestly the perfect pick because you... It's that's a shield of protection. You can't yes. ever say anything about their policies because they identify as transgender. Yeah, um, you know the choices you and your husband Seth, um, also who has been a guest on our show, uh, have made have led you to sort of opt out of conventional public education system for a variety of reasons. Yeah, but as anyone who follows you, it is also kind of you've kind of got, had a different path to cope with COVID. And that's created some some interesting feedback on its own too, far above that that stupid meme. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm right now. I'm looking at my kids. They I have like this weird window situation. They're playing Zingo in our homeschool room. We have like a library homeschool room. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So we we have homeschooled um, long before COVID made it you know popular. We my oldest daughter is uh, she's eight years old tomorrow, um, and she's in happy grade. birthday, oldest daughter, almost. Yeah. Um, and so, I mean, this is her third year being homeschooled and, um, I I mean, we obviously three years ago, we had no idea what was coming, but we're so incredibly grateful that this was already our educational path because, um, in 2020 and also in 2021, in the beginning of the school year last fall, I, I heard from a lot of people who, um, who didn't have the luxury of time that I have had thinking about how do I homeschool? What does, what do I want to look like? I, I had thought about homeschooling for several years prior to my oldest going into kindergarten. And so I kind of had the luxury of time to look at, uh, educational philosophy and different curriculums. And, um, and even, even having had that luxury of time, I've still sort of switched things around year by year as I think every homeschooling parent does. Um, but I mean, we're so incredibly blessed to have had this flexibility because uh, we never had to do Zoom school that we didn't sign up for. My kids actually do do a couple do bleh, they do a couple of Zoom classes, but of our own choice with someone who's actually like really good at Zoom, um, and um, and they didn't have to go in masks. Um, the I I really worry about kids. Uh, in kindergarten and in first grade, uh, especially who are having to learn how to read and uh, like read literacy, one thing, but also read emotions. And um, it's extremely hard in a mask to to do that. My four-year-old did a preschool program last year when he was three. And he said something to me that I found like really profound for a three-year-old. He was like, "Some this XYZ happened with my teacher and I didn't know if she was mad at me or not. And he didn't recognize that he didn't, he didn't realize why he didn't know, but he, he recognized that it was strange. He's like, I couldn't tell. I didn't know if she was mad. And in my head, I was like, yeah, bud, cause she's covering half of her mm-hmm. face. And that's a lot of, you know, emotion that's being shielded from you. Um, but the, the, there's going to be a lot of, um, sociologists in the next 10, 15, 20 years who are like, what is wrong with children that were born in around 2015? And it's like, oh, well, because you made them mask and because you made their teachers mask, which I actually yeah. think is a bigger issue. I think that the teachers masking is a bigger issue than the kids themselves masking um, because they can't see their faces and because they can't see their lips. Um, but, um, but yeah, I mean, we're going to, we're going to see this. It's a, it's going to be a real live science experiment. What happens? Yeah, and a lot of doctoral theses will be written yeah. on this. It's going to be like, oh, well, that was surprising and unexpected. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, I agree. And it's um, all kinds of pathologies, all kinds of um, unintended consequences are going to flow from these yeah. decisions about which no one gave any real thought. Um, no one balanced these concerns. It was just, you know, sort of paranoia. And, you know, public health emergency, which was a real public health emergency, yeah. um, but nevertheless was about giving power, <laughs> about changing things. And it became kind of mixed up with politics, mixed up with all kinds of philosophical issues 
that actually have little to do with health. Um, like most debates relating to COVID, the one around vaccines has been particularly uh, divisive and distorted. In the pre-coronavirus era, both of us, um, as writers, yeah. uh, were very strong critics of anti-vaxxers. Uh, but the embrace of government-enforced mandates has, while not undermining the value of vaccinations against disease, especially against COVID, it's also produced a debate that's very different from the one we were having before um, you know, the late uh, winter, early spring of 2020. As someone who is yourself vaccinated, um, you actually chose to get it while you were pregnant, something that some people are very afraid to do. How do you feel about vaccine mandates, um, their impact on individual rights, on minorities, and society in general? How do you think this is, is playing out, and, and what damage do you think that's doing? Yeah, so, I mean, especially sort of as someone who got vaccinated while I was pregnant, um, it's funny, I had sort of a, a moment yesterday where I was thinking to myself, like, would I make the same decision now that I made um, I don't know, however many months ago, six months ago now. Um, and I, I, and I'm not sure. Um, I was talking to a doctor who she has a baby exactly the same age. Our babies are a week and a half apart. And she said that she chose not to get vaccinated because she was afraid of the inflammation risk, uh, it, on the fetus. And I was like, Ooh, yeah, that's actually a, a good point that I didn't really think of. And there are some sort of neurological concerns with a developing fetus when there's inflammation. At the same time, I have a friend who uh, contracted COVID when she was pregnant, and she spent 12 days on a ventilator, and she uh, spent all night last night in the emergency room, uh, tachycardic, uh, with suspected preeclampsia, both of which are directly tied to her COVID uh, saga about, it was like early August, so two months ago now. Um, and... She's wondering very correctly, what did those 12 days on a ventilator and all of the medical interventions that I had over the course of my COVID diagnosis, how did that impact my developing baby? And we don't know. We, do, we don't know the answers to any of these questions. And that's, I think, the thing that a lot of people don't really recognize, that there, there's no easy answers for, I think, anyone. And I think everyone has to play their own personal risk cost benefit analysis on their own lives. And that's why the mandates are just infuriating because for for folks like me, if I worked for an airline or if I worked for a hospital, any number of places, I would have been forced to be vaccinated or lose my job. And I was, you know, weighing my choices myself personally with all of the information at hand. And it's not a one size fits all answer. And, um, and I think that it, it really sort of takes uh, necessary agency away from people to make these decisions. I don't think anyone wants to get COVID and die. I think everyone's making their own benefit, like cost benefit analyses. And um, people are, you know, having to live with those choices one way or another. And I think that those natural consequences are, are the best mandate there is. And it's the, it's the best way to make people sort of um, make their own choices. Uh, I, I, I've seen sort of, I've been following the data and in places like Louisiana, uh, in, in and around the Baton Rouge, um, Baton Rouge, New Orleans area, when they had a huge spike and they, and their hospitals were quite busy earlier this summer, um, vaccinations spiked also because people saw their friends and neighbors getting COVID and, um, and they didn't need a mandate to do that. They just kind of saw it. And, the people that didn't, like, they were making their choices and they kind of have to live or, in some cases, die with them. Um, life is not fair and life is not easy, but um, I th the mandates are a real, um, a real restriction on our uh, personal medical liberty that I'm deeply uncomfortable with. And it, it makes me think about, like, should I have felt the same way about vaccines before this? Should I have been so full-throated in my support of other kind of mandates? And I, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I don't know the right answer. Yeah, I, th I think, the as I said, the debates we were having two years ago about this issue um, were not, you know, yes, they involve some of the same issues, but 
they revolved around, you know, should should you vaccinate kids who were in, in schools yeah. for measles, things that we, you know, we kind of knew what we were talking about. Um, we know the measles vaccine works. We know what happens when people don't have it. Right. And, um, and I, I think also the biggest difference is the people for, I mean, I'm thinking specifically of the measles, the people for whom the measles is the biggest risk are people who are unable to be vaccinated. These, these people. Yeah. And for COVID, the people who are the biggest risk are the elderly who have had ample opportunity to get vaccinated. And they have enough agency, enough personal responsibility that if they are not vaccinated for whatever reason, they have the ability to to sort of shield themselves and to cocoon themselves. And if that's the decision they want to make, they can make that decision. Babies can't make that decision. Yeah. Yeah, I'm also really troubled. Um, and I think this applies to a lot of the things that we've been talking about is the way that, you know, fear about, you know, the virus, which is a real thing. Mm -hmm. And the fear is a real thing. And it's it's reasonable to be afraid. Um, has shown how ready people are to, you know, give up their own freedom and their own rights for the perception of safety. And now we're seeing not you know not not surprisingly that they're even more eager to give up other people's rights yeah. and, and dispense with them and that's where this vaccine mandate thing comes in where we're having whole you know classes of people whether it's pilots whether it's uh you know nurses policemen um who choose not to be vaccinated for whatever reason and they're losing their jobs or we've created uh, situations, you know, I, I recently, spent, I, I mentioned it in my opening, you know, I spent some time in New York in the last couple of weeks, and I spent some time in Florida in the last couple of weeks, which is like two different planets. Yeah. Um, in Florida, you know, it's like the free state of Florida, as people told me when I got there, you know, nobody's wearing masks indoors or outdoors. In New York, we have a very rigorous COVID regime where if you want to get into a restaurant, you can you have to show not only your vaccination card but your photo ID to match against it, which is of course fascinating to me because you know <laughs> liberals, blue state uh, Democrats have finally found a way to love photo IDs. Yep. I guess as long as you're not voting with them. Um, but even more so, you know, speaking of the voting issue, is that the statistics on vaccinations have shown a real divide between the races. Um, much of the media focuses on the idea that Republicans are, are vaccine resistant. You know, it's, it's Tucker Carlson and Laura Ingram on Fox who are sort of uh, promoting the idea of skepticism and that it's, it's about politics. You know, it's like, as I said, uh, you know, the, the mask being Team Blue's MAGA cap. But in fact, the real divide, much greater, is between people who are white and people who are black. Um, vaccination rates among African Americans are much lower than among whites. And yet we have created a situation in places where there are vaccine mandates um, and passes to literally get into places that if you aren't vaccinated, which, you know, and if you're black, you're, you know, approximately half of, of black people are not vaccinated or 40% of them, much higher percentage. Um, they're literally banned from theaters, movies, uh, restaurants, the entire public square. Yeah. Um, in another context, we would call that Jim Crow. And indeed, the whole argument about uh, voting rights and about so-called voter suppression is the notion that requiring voter ID, which Republicans think is a voter integrity, a vote integrity measure, um, Democrats call it voter suppression. Well, the idea that Blacks are less likely to have a photo ID, and therefore, you know, it's a disparate impact. Um, that's that's a, actually a projection. The majority of black, overwhelming majority of blacks have photo IDs. They support the idea of, of requiring photo IDs. But when it comes to vaccination, it's not a model. It's not a projection. It's not a theory. It's an actual thing that you're banning a lot of people and a lot of a, of a what in otherwise would be a protected class from the public square. And yet, other than a few squeaky voices like mine and some other people's, nobody's talking about that. Yeah. Isn't that strange? Yeah. No, it's crazy. I, I got an email recently 
from the Baltimore Symphony Orchestra. And I know that this is another issue that's close to your heart too. Mm -hmm. And I, I've been incredibly sympathetic to the arts this whole time. And my sympathy is more or less run out. Um, because now the, the policy of the BSO is you have to be vaccinated in order to come in. And so I, I, see, I come at that from two angles. Well, three angles. One is I'm not showing my vaccine card to anyone, and I'm not even sure I know where it is. So <laughs> I, I, th I think that a lot of the people, the nurses, the airline pilots, I, I have a friend who's, um, who's in the federal government, sort of in law enforcement, and he is vaccinated, has been vaccinated, and he actually was vaccinated in January by by his agency, and he will not show his vaccine card just on principle. He's like, it's none of your business. No. And, like, they know he's vaccinated. They vaccinated him. Um, so I think that there's also people like like me who are just like, I'm not I'm not showing you my vaccine card. That's not that's not a game I'm playing. But as far well, as – no soup for you. I mean – Right, right. So, I mean, but it's no it's no ticket for the BSO. They're not getting my money. So that's one. Two is they've also banned by default by default my children. And that's yeah. w why we went to the BSO. And, and what I don't think they understand or care about, I'm, not, I'm honestly not sure, is how do you think your lights are going to turn on and be paid in 20, 30, 40, 50 years when the generation – that grew up with the ability to go to the symphony orchestra, mine and yours, die. How how committed are my children going to be to the arts that have closed them out in this like really important and formative few years of their lives? Um, I imagine they're not going to have the same connection to the arts that we have. And that's directly a result of the BSO and the Met and all of these places banning them from going into it for year into the buildings for years. Mm -hmm. um, and the third thing- that's And with no end in sight to that, by the way. With no end in sight, yeah. And I, I mean, this is a separate conversation, but it seems like pretty soon kids are going to be able to be vaccinated. And only one third of parents are like jumping the gun to do it. Um, so that's gonna be a whole other issue. And I think people are going to vaccinate their children with the hopes that, um, this ends for them and you can look at college campuses to learn that that's just not the case every kid on a college campus is vaccinated. i mean your daughter who is just here i'm sure she can jump on and tell you mm -hmm. what her campus is like it is dystopian i bet you right sure yeah yeah to some extent yeah yeah so everyone on campus is vaccinated and it's not over on college campuses so why do we think it's going to be over at elementary schools or anywhere else so i mean that's number two number three is the BSO is smack dab in the middle of Baltimore. They have spent more money on trying to bring in local black residents to be interested in their offerings than anything else. They, when they did um, the 500th anniversary of Beethoven, they planned most of their programming around how can we interest, how can we make this interesting to the inner city residents of Baltimore versus like, how can we just celebrate the life of Beethoven? So they've now thrown all of that work out the window <laughs> because yeah. they can't, they're not going to let them in now. Right. So what were you doing for the last, you know, 15 years? Because you actually don't care about equity or inclusion or diversity or any of it. So at the end of the day, who is, what butts are sitting in the BSO seats? And the answer is old white people who are going to die and, you know. And that was already a problem. Uh, yeah, the, 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 exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, this just basically signed the death warrant of these kinds of places. Yeah. And they're also not really prepared to deal with the rules that they've even get. I can tell you from having oh, been Oh, I was Carnegie, curious. I was Having been in Carnegie you. Hall, um, it was, as we say in Hebrew, a balagan. Um, really? Checking, <laughs> checking everybody's, the, the line stretched around that institution for a very long time and they only barely got everybody in. So in that's kind of my hope as to how this all ends is just how onerous it all is just becomes too much and people just stop because they, it's just too, it's too much, especially with the labor shortage. Like you can't have 20 bouncers looking at vaccine cards at the end of the day where it's just like, you know what? Everyone come in or don't come in. Yeah. Well, we'll see how that plays out. I want to shift our topic just a bit to other issues. 
And as someone who is a very public Jew on social media, I'd like to ask you for some of your thoughts on the way anti-Semitism has been legitimized in the, in the last year um, by the anti-Zionism left. Now, how do you think the, the impact of ideas like critical race theory and intersectionality, which I think sort of give a permission slip in some ways to anybody who is identified with white privilege, which also plays into a lot of our coronavirus debates, have played in the process of making Jew hatred fashionable, or at least more fashionable, and the kind of uh, garbage that we see on, on social media even more prevalent. So I thought the Ben and Jerry's interview with Axios was incredibly instructive. Um, Alexi, I can't remember her last name. Sorry. Mm-hmm. Her Twitter handle is just Alexi. Sorry, I have some Okay, we'll just call here. her that for the moment. I don't Alexi, remember. Alexi, yeah, we're tight. I, it's a first name basis. So <laughs> she did an interview with the, with the founders, the owners, Ben and Jerry, and mm-hmm. asked them like, okay, so – you are Ben Cohen and Jerry Epstein, yeah. the founders of the ice cream company. They're Jewish. I don't know if you could tell by their last names. Yeah, right. But even Ben and Jerry are anti-Semitic. And she asked them, she's like, okay, so you've decided to you know, make these economic steps against Israel. That what about BDS against parts of Israel? Yeah. Yeah. So, but what about Texas with the abortion law and they were like yeah that's a pretty big market for us we don't really want to get into that mm-hmm. and she's like okay well what about Georgia with voting rights and they're like ooh that's also kind of dicey and it's like okay so why'd you pick Israel and why'd you pick this topic and they were stumped and yeah. the thing they couldn't say was well it's the it's the Jews it's Israel it's not it, it's not about ideology it's not about belief it's it's just about targeting Jews. And this is um, this is sort of the last the last real hatred that you can have in in polite society and not not really be sorry about it. Um, and we, we saw it um, we saw it with all of the attacks on visible Jews in um, in Brooklyn and New York City more generally in the last couple of years. Uh, what I found really funny was Jonathan Wiseman of the New York Times. <laughs> he discovered anti-Semitism. Yeah, and right. And was like, oh, sorry, I just dropped my mic. Actually, it was my baby. I'm going to blame him. Um, <laughs> he discovered it and he was like, guys, this is a thing. And he wrote a whole book. But if you actually read his book, um, which I don't recommend, but if, gosh, I'm sorry. Um, but if you do, you know, find yourself in the library during a uh, story hour with some time to kill, which is what I had, and you you skim through it, you find some like actually pretty anti-Semitic stuff in there. Um, he, he describes himself as sort of a, a, an, a cultured Jew, not like the slovenly um, Hasidic Jews of Brooklyn. Like this is how he quantifies his Jewishness and, and by sort of demeaning anyone who is more visibly Jewish than himself. And this was, you know, this is this is a book on anti-Semitism from a New York Times writer. And he didn't get any pushback outside of, I think, Ellie Steinberg writing for the foreword. Um, mm. That's like really the only pushback he got. So even in a book about anti-Semitism, there's some anti-Semitism. Yeah, it's it's it is it is the fashion. Um, Jews are, are considered white. They're considered privileged. Israel is considered white and privileged, even mm-hmm. though by the you know, definitions that uh, people on the left use, majority of Israeli Jews are people of color. But so what? Um, and that places them you know, on, on just in the crosshairs of, of intellectual fashion. Um, and there doesn't seem to be... You know, it, it seems locked in um, on the left, and uh, then it just becomes a partisan issue if you bring it up. Um, I want I want to, in the time we have left, uh, to talk about another issue on which you've been particularly outspoken and on which your writing has been particularly persuasive, in which is the treatment of women and how politics and culture have diminished respect for women and their privacy. Um, in two instances, one involving the violation of female privacy in the name of transgender rights, and the other, even more well-known and more recent, um, in which uh, left-wing activists uh, chased uh, Arizona Senator Kirsten Cinema uh, into a bathroom and filmed her there um, in an effort to in- intimidate her into backing the uh, Biden administration and the Progressive Caucus's 3.5 massive 
$3.5 trillion massive spending bill, the rights of women were considered less important than some political issue, and many on the left actually cheered these invasions. As someone who was yourself the victim of an invasion of your privacy in a very well-known case of a rabbi taping women in a, in a mikvah, what do you think it says about our society that so many Americans have decided for rec- respect for women is so expendable? Yeah, I mean, it's it's really honestly quite telling. Um, there was a story that broke yesterday in the Daily Wire that should be front page news everywhere in America. And it really, if conservatives did the sort of operated in the same way that that liberals did, there would literally have been riots afterwards. And and what the Daily, Daily Wire sort of uncovered and exposed was that in Loudoun County in Virginia, which is a sort of far out suburb of Washington, D.C., the school district, uh, the school board was pushing for transgender bathrooms. And at the same time, and like I have children present, so I'm just going to use some euphemisms here. There was um, a really horrifying and violent, egregious violation of a young woman in a bathroom by one of these gender fluid students. And uh, her father appeared at the school board meeting to protest these sort of policies. And he was painted by the school board as a bigot. And he was literally dragged out and called a domestic terrorist. And so then he was faced with a choice. Do I violate my daughter's privacy as to what happened to her and sort of tell my story? Or do I let them continue to paint this issue like like I'm just a bigot? And so it, it came out that, you know, this this happened to his daughter and it, it didn't stop there. The the school district transferred the the violent offender and he reoffended and did this to yet another student on October 9th. And now, I mean, today, literally, we're seeing how much the left cares about women. Have you heard this story in any mainstream outlets? Because I haven't. No, not at no. all. This is, this is Catholic church level stuff. They had a predator. They enabled the predator. They pretty much gave the predator a free pass in order to predate when they became aware of just how, like, if you look at the charging documents, what this what this person was charged with, what this man was charged with, is um, gives you a window into how vicious this attack was and how this is going to stay with this young woman for the rest of her life. They took that information and they moved him into a different school where he could do this to another girl. This is everything that we have been saying is wrong with the Catholic Church. and Which had is, its own you know, which, um, yeah. problem with, with priests um, uh, abusing young children for generations. Mm-hmm. And they're, they're, I mean, they're totally happy to paint any priest as, as a child predator. And now they have a predation problem on their own hands, and they are silent. And this is a young woman, two young women now, who have been victimized because of them, because of their policies. And it's not over. And if if we were an honest society, if we were a caring society, if we were a just society, we would put the brakes on transgender bathrooms in schools. And we would say we can have a third separate stall, like sort of like a family bathroom where it's just you have privacy, anyone can go into that bathroom. But no, that's that's not that's not what they want. They want men biological males to have access to female bathrooms and that has dangerous consequences and they don't care they don't care what happens to young women and it's all these transgender issues only go one way they only hurt women and you don't see women going on to men's sports teams and usurping their position at the top of the pile you don't see women going into men's bathrooms and being being predators. This only goes in one direction, and it's against women, and they do not care. Yeah, clearly. Um, and these issues, again, it's, you know, whatever the politics of it, whether it's transgender rights or, you know, in, in the case with Kristen Sinema as well, she's, she's a, you know, an evil conservative. Somehow she became a conservative. Um, and that was more important than the principle of 
privacy, uh, you know, of, of treating someone with respect, treating anyone with respect, let alone a, you know, a sitting U.S. senator chasing her into a bathroom. Um, one, one shudders to think what would happen if, you know, like Project Veritas did that to AOC, um, you know, <laughs> um, and, and they would deserve a program if they did, yet um, this is considered okay. And even Joe Biden um, said, well, it's just what happened. I mean, believe me, anybody who would start harassing him in, in, the, in the years when he was the senator, you know, senator on Amtrak, um, if somebody harassed him on the train, they would get thrown off the train. I mean, that's, you know. And, and rightfully and, so. There and are rightfully lines so. for a reason. Yeah. Um, you know, you mentioned uh, talking about the, the parent in that case being treated like a domestic terrorist. Obviously, that's a major issue with the Attorney General Merrick Garland um, issuing a letter treating parents who push back against a critical race theory and to sort of allow the FBI to treat this as a domestic terror incident. Again, I guess my, my question is, what does it say about us, you know, sort of this bifurcated nation, blue nation, red nation, that a lot of people think it's really just okay um, to, to treat people who talk up at school board meetings, whether they're being obnoxious or whether they're being polite, um, you know, <laughs> As, uh, as as Chris Cuomo um, said about the Black Lives Matter, you know, since when do you know since when do protests have to be peaceful? Um, and yet, the, that's okay because we now have not only lost the ability to listen to each other as a country, we now no longer credit each other with good motives, and think the other side belongs in jail, basically. Yeah, no, and it, it's infuriating, especially because of I mean, the domestic terror, terrorist stuff. We can't sort of make a – sorry, my two-year-old just ejected herself from her crib, so I'm sorry. Okay. Speaking um, of the fight for freedom. Yeah. <laughs> she, she fought it. She won. Um, the so – we, we can't make any sort of differential – distinction between people who are protesting the school boards by going to the homes of the school board members and protesting outside their homes. Obviously, that's crossing a line. But there is a difference between those people and the people who are going and signing up to speak and who are justifiably really upset and really worried and care deeply about their children and their education. And there's no distinction made. If you're upset at a school board, you're a domestic terrorist. And the blurring of lines of boundaries um, has really serious consequences. And the, those boundaries are, you know, in the bathrooms with Kristen Cinema, And then there's also um, at the homes of school boards versus at school board meetings. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I think the consequences here are far greater than just, you know, one terrible soundbite or one, you know, viral video of people behaving badly. I think it's about, we, we hear a lot from uh, people uh, on the left about their, their desire to defend democracy, but in fact, what they want is not democracy. They want to shut their opponents up. Um, people like you and me who, who talk for a living and, and speak out for a living um, we've spent our whole careers being told to shut up or being, you know, slurred with silly memes. Um, but yet, you know, that's where we are as a nation. At any rate, Bethany, you've given us so much to think about, a lot of great insight, and you've done it under really interesting circumstances, um, dealing with your kids, <laughs> always. Um, your life is an ongoing adventure for those of us. As I once told you, I, I, I've never watched reality shows, but I follow you, follow you <laughs> on Instagram. So I can't really say that anymore because you are a reality show and, and a fascinating one. Thank you for taking the time under, uh, as I say, a lot of pressure there, homeschooling and with small children uh, to come on Top Story. I uh, really appreciate it and really appreciate everything you had to say. Thank you also to our audience for tuning in, whether on um, the various audio platforms like Spotify or uh, on our, the JNS YouTube channel or eventually on um, uh, JBS TV. Please like subscribe, give us good reviews, and please tune in again next week where we'll be welcoming you back to Top Story. Thank you and see you then.
I hope you enjoyed this week's episode brought to you by the Jewish News Syndicate, JNS.org. Visit us at JNS.org and please follow at Amazon and Spotify wherever you listen to podcasts.